So how should we start this? Um, let me see. Like you would a normal one. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about the time. Difference. Yeah. How about how about how about good evening? Good evening. You know. Not quite. Not quite there, but yeah. But good evening somewhere I mean, in between. I would say apparently I would say good morning to you or good afternoon to you, and you would say good evening to me. Is that how it works? Is that how the English language let's, works? Let's let's do that and yeah. try to make it look like it wasn't contrived. Today's guest is the man behind the music, the music from all of my interviews up to this point. He's a very good friend of mine. We both went to Mercyhurst at the same time. We started a poetry group together at Mercyhurst, among others. Shout out to all of y'all. Went out to Ireland for a visit, and him and I lived out in Galway City for a couple of months. Went busking the whole nine yards. He was a... For a long time, I thought he was a figment of my imagination when I, when I came back from Ireland. But luckily, the internet prevailed and social media has done its thing. But I'm talking too much. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Tony Fahey. What's going on, my man? Going on. Good afternoon. So personally, how has, how has COVID affected you um, and... Um, what were sort of things that you had to go through? So um, I live in South Korea. I lived here for 10 years. Um, and I teach uh, English at a university in a city called Wanju. And Wanju is in the center of the country, about two hours from Seoul on train or bus. And it immediately had an effect across the country. Even though it didn't happen in the city I live in, um, the government immediately um, began to test, uh, trace test around the country, um, isolate anyone who got the virus, and basically respond to cluster infections quite quickly. But in terms of my own life, immediately uh, as a teacher, we went from face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching. And... I was lucky in a sense because teaching at a university, uh, we have breaks between semesters and we had you know, a couple of weeks to, uh, I guess, prepare, if you, if you can call it pre preparation, but get ready for teaching online all of a sudden. At the same time, there was a lot of uncertainty uh, living in the city because no one knew how, how deadly the virus was at the time, how you know, how easy it was to contract it. Nobody knew this. And so in terms of travel and in terms of meeting people you knew, you, uh, meeting people you know, it was, there was a lot of uncertainty back in the spring and into the summer of last year. Um, and that, you know, in terms of living in Wanju, we've never had in this city a, a massive infection. There have been uh, cluster infections, but what it has done is that the social distancing rules have applied in this city. There are periods where people couldn't go to restaurants or bars like, every, like most countries in the world at, at its worst. Everyone had to, we still have to wear masks outside all the time. I think now, in, you know, it basically we're at the point where it started last year. It's been a whole year as I talk to you right now. I would say that things are no better or worse, but people are a bit more 
they, they know more and there's a bit more certainty about what is happening. You've got 10 times the population of Ireland in this country and everyone is living in 30% of the country, landmass. So you're talking about like a lot of people, um, which kind of puts in perspective social distancing and stuff at the top of the conversation and, and wearing masks. You know, I, I, do, I do understand that people may have problems in terms of the, uh, the restrictions on their life in certain contexts. But when you put it into the context of living in Asia, um, you really have to obey these rules in order to, 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 to help the government fight this because, you know, my next door neighbor is there. My other neighbor is there. If I go outside, there will be people right away there. It's, it's, um, it's a highly populated country. Things, like I said, people are a bit more, we're more relaxed and more used to it now. And we know more. So we're still going by the rules of social distancing. We're still wearing masks, still teaching online. Um, there are travel restrictions, of course, but uh, it's a bit easier to deal with now, I think, at this point, a full year on. There's been many, um, many examples of people coming together virtually or doing things in a, in a safe manner while COVID was going, was going on. Um, given that you've been living in, in Korea for 10 years, I mean, what kind of things have you been doing to stay in contact with the people that you're close to out there? Well, that's a good question. Um, when the social distancing rules were not, were not too stringent, um, of course, uh, bars and restaurants were restricted, but I, I play football with a, with a group of guys, my friends out here. For us, you know, us gringo Americanos over here, that's, um, that's soccer. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful game. <laughs> and uh, we used to meet up every weekend. We still did this anyway, but it became much more of a staple because we used to meet up every weekend when we were permitted might I add. And um, we play some football. And then afterwards, we were able to, you know, get together, have a chat, maybe have a drink um, in, you know, a more open space, not a bar, maybe, we, you know, just some place that was safe. But due to maybe restrictions becoming more strict, you know, you would, you probably meet one or two of your friends you know, at each other's homes or even just a video call sometimes, you know, just stuff to try and keep, keep yourself, um, you know, uh, connected to people like, and, and try to keep yourself a little bit sane. It's, it's not just about the coronavirus over here because, you know, living in South Korea, you're part of an expat community. And for example, my friends are American, English, South African, uh, Canadian. South Korean and you do have to stay in contact with each other um, on a normal basis just to kind of deal with kind of social pressure I think you know it's not just about going out and having beers or whatever it, there is a there is a thing where you you know you kind of have to stay connected because um, living here can have its pressures as well like any country if you if you, you know if you live abroad and not just with my friends here, but I have been, you know, I have Skyped and Zoom calls, friends from all around the world during this time as well, because you kind of want to touch base with them dealing with the same pressures. And that, that's that been important. Um, I think for two reasons. Number one, just for the, you know, just for conversation and catching up with a friend. But I also think it's been really interesting to talk to people from the States and from Ireland it's almost like getting a, a person's perspective on the ground has been far more informative than the news at times, I think. How did all this affect you personally? Well, I suppose, you know, there's the initial thing where you can't travel. So normally I would have gone home to see, or we, myself and my wife, would have gone home to see my family in the summertime. 
All right. So let's just say travel restrictions. You couldn't leave the country. That's fine. You know, it's not it wasn't such a big deal. But you'd also be worried about your family. Right. So my, my parents and my brother and sister and their 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 kids and family, they live in Ireland. So that that would have had a little bit of an effect. But I, as you know, my parents live out in the countryside way out there. So um I, life hasn't really changed for them, to be honest. So they, uh, but they're, they're doing well. They're doing well. Your dad but, is sending me all these Irish jokes. <laughs> He's cracking me up now. Yeah. <laughs> but they're, like I said, they're, they're, um, life hasn't really changed for m- much for them. But you do worry about, you know, your significant people in your family because, you know, I, obviously I don't meet them every day, but... They're there, I'm here. And of course, we probably had more contact over the last year, longer conversations. And that's been really cool and and good for them and me. Then I suppose in terms of one of the biggest changes was teaching online because teaching online really is more time consuming than teaching face to face. I I love being in a classroom. There's something about teaching language that needs social interaction and uh, and I have a lot of energy in the classroom as well so firstly I mean we, we pre- pretty much had to kind of learn as we went with teaching online that was fine because it's a good skill to learn but there's a lot more time invested in recording videos making materials um, changing semester to semester uh, to the needs of students because you know they they also are dealing with something where they're at home, and I think the biggest change for me, how it's affecting me, is just the time consumption of the work teaching online um, professionally, and that kind of eats into other parts of your life then as well, right? So you know you you spend some of your weekends making making materials that you wouldn't normally do for class and whatnot. And then it just carries over. And also, you know, staring at computer screens for God knows how many hours a day has not, it's not, it's not in my genetic makeup to do that. So, uh, you know, I, I've had a few headaches over the last year as well. So that's, so just professionally, that's been the biggest effect on me. I suppose personally, you would say that, when you live in another country um, and people are, for example, they're a bit scared because there's an unknown virus out there. If you're a, if you're a foreigner living in a country, it is natural for people to be afraid of something different or to perceive something different as a threat. Now, I've never felt that in a strong way, but during the period of uneasiness, And this could happen in any country, not just South Korea, could be Ireland, my own country. I'm sure you could speak for that back where you're from. But during a period of stress or tension, you know, people tend to view you a little bit differently. They tend to keep their distance. And that's a problem, you know, not ongoing, but from time to time, that is a problem that you're dealing with that pressure. But it's it's amplified a little bit under times of duress. It's almost like you try to go out of your way um, to, like, be out of your way. I I mean, at least for me. And maybe it's because, you know, we haven't been out, right, for for such a long time. And we don't know how – we we never really understood how that would really affect us in such a way where it's – it's – it's – it's a – it's a – it's a – it becomes a, you know, a a mental thing, a, a mental health thing where I, I actually think about, you know, what, what is, what is it going to actually look like when we're 100% open? There's a lot of people now that I've talked to there that are just like, uh, you know what, look, I got, I, I, I got the internet. I got a 60 inch screen TV. Now Chipotle delivers, (laughs) you know? So it's like, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a lot of that happening. Right. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, is that people are getting used to the social distancing, which is also interesting. Yeah. And just to 
amplify on the, the pressure thing. Like, you know, uh, you can read the news that day and the slightest wording of a headline can make your day so much more worse based on, you know, somebody arbitrarily writing an article somewhere. It's not a huge problem, but it is a, an issue you deal with. You read the news during these times because it does affect how people perceive you and how people are perceiving others. But on the point of, uh, yeah, the, the changes and, you know, whether they'll change back, we, we joked about this, me and a, a friend of mine, and we were saying, like, some of our students, I'm sure it's, it suits them to be very close to their computer and their pajamas and, you know, some of them. And so it's going to be very difficult for them to come back into a classroom and be more social and, you know, they're, they're used to delivery, same as you, like the point you made there as well. They're, they're used to things. Now, some of this is not all negative. I think that uh, there will be changes that are for the better. But I think the biggest issue people might deal with is the social aspect. I think how is they're basically out of practice with meeting people. And that, you know, as a teacher, that's my job. You know, I, and I, I, I normally have a hard time getting them going. I can't imagine what it's going to be like after this. But I look forward to the challenge anyway, you know. It's not, it's not something that scares me, but it's also, it is, um, how can I say this? It is something that could really shake up the social spectrum in this country and from what you're saying back in the States and other places as well. Since you brought up your students, um, in general, how, how, how can you, um, how have they been taking this? Well, you know, you can kind of gauge from semester to semester an overall feeling of the students from their comments about things and what they want to talk about. And most of them would have had to take classes at home if they're commuting. So they're with their parents all day, they're at home. And eventually when you get them discussing stuff, they will say that they just, they, they hope to be able to travel again. They hope to be able to um, see their friends or they hope to be able to get back to school. I never thought I'd hear them say that. But um, I think an issue too for them is just that they're at home kind of same thing in the dark looking at a screen all the time and i think in terms of that age you're if you're going to university it has a big change especially on students in this country it is kind of a watershed mark in terms of being social and learning how to be social as well and they're missing out on that so you're going to have a generation of students that have skipped a year or two of development socially and they're going to go into a workforce and ex be expected to do the same thing, you know, well, missing out on, the, on those years that could have really uh, shaped them and helped them. So I worry for it a little bit. I, I worry because I get a feeling of kind of anxiety from them. And I also don't see the system changing to accommodate that. I don't see them say, hey, take two years out there, go travel and come back. That that wouldn't suit the narrative, at least here. There's a lot of pressure to get jobs, a lot of pressure to, to, to do well. So I feel bad for the students because um, they, it's going to be tough post COVID as well. As an educator, what are some of the things that you see moving forward as the learning experiences through that and how education can't what can what can education look like moving forward well it's it's a great point because you know as a teacher who would like i said i enjoy being in the classroom and i enjoy uh, the interaction and kind of breaking the mold in terms of students idea of learning that they should be interacting and and you know if they're going to use a language they should use it communicating to somebody but what's been really great for me, and this is the positive of all these hours that uh, I've invested into trying to um, adapt to teaching online, is that 
there are a lot of resources online now, like a lot of different ways to teach. And the thing about it is, is that I don't see us going back just to face-to-face -to -face teaching. I think that online teaching, there's going to be some sort of hybrid, and there should be. And all of this, I look at it, I look on it as training. It's not a situation I'm stuck at. I look at it as training as a positive thing because I've come out of it having learned how to use various platforms online, but also being put in a strange situation. I'm basically teaching with, for example, 20 different avatars on a screen. I often, you know, I may not even see their face sometimes. So it's just this thing about trying to promote interaction by, you know, being the only voice in the room initially. It's very strange. Pushing yourself in that regard, there are things that you can do to get them to interact. And then they find themselves doing that after a few weeks without, without you. So my point is, is that those skills can be carried forward into normal teaching afterwards in different guise. And um, I doubt, for example, if later on this year, let's just say coronavirus eases down to a point where we're back in the classrooms, um, I doubt that we will be allowed to be fully face-to-face -face in a, you know, a circle of students and talking to each and breathing on top of each other, we're talking and, and communicating to each other. There will still be restrictions and almost, it's going to be an even stranger situation because you're going to be in a room, you're going to be wearing a mask, they're going to be wearing a mask, and you're going to be lecturing on language and communication. It's, you know, so it, it, it gets more absurd the more you think about it. But the thing about it is, is that we now have the, the, uh, the assets and the skills to circumvent that problem, to be creative. And... Um, yeah, look, looking on it positively, it is definitely, uh, it's just an unknown road, but it's definitely going to be something different. For me personally, it's been uh, a year long crash course in teaching online, which I, know, I mean, I've, under different circumstances, I might have paid somebody for that. So I, <laughs> it's been interesting, you know. How have you been able to occupy your time when you had, when you have time? This is a softball question. Don't get it wrong. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure you know that a lot of my focus outside of teaching is, is music and art. And I kick football and I, I like to have a pint, but um, a lot of my passions and, and focus outside of my job has always been music and art, which before Corona, I did it the same way as I do during Corona. I record at home and I, you know, I, I work on various projects, as you know, and that has never changed. And the only issue is that maybe there has been more time invested in teaching, but that's, that's fine. But my, to, to occupy my mind, I've just kept myself healthy. That's been very important. Um, try to get exercise in whatever way I can. But more important for mental health um, has been to stay focused on projects, musically, artistically, stay in contact with friends, usually about the projects as well, right? But... Um, yeah, that's, you know, stay, stay close to my passions and make sure that there's progress with them as well. Don't, don't use it as too much of an excuse that I'm feeling down to not focus on them. Because it works as a, a kind of a meditation for me. Um, 
I would say that if I if I go record something for three or four hours, it is work, but it's something I lose myself in, and therefore I forget for a couple of hours about you know the news headlines that day or whatever restrictions are being applied or you know even if work is stressing me out, it goes away. And I try to keep it simple as well. Um, you know, it's it's a long winter in Korea. And it just started getting sunny again. So and this, people take this for granted, but I firmly believe that, like, you know, we're no different to plants in that regard. I think that, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to blame it on things like uh, it's all to blame on the coronavirus, but it might be to blame on just simple things and taking care of yourself as well. Mental health has um, definitely had more focus because of this. And I think it's, it's, it's a good thing because people are starting to take care of themselves in different ways. When I say exercise, I mean, going outside for a walk. I don't mean like, you know, <laughs> trying to go fight somebody in a gym in the dark or something like that. I mean, like taking care of yourself, but there's two sides. There's the physical exercise, getting outside. And of course the mental exercise is staying, working on what I'm good at. And I'm good at music and art. And I need to take care of that. But I've always taken care of it. So I just try to not let the situation get in the way of that. Has the pandemic influenced any of your work? I would say so, actually. Um, I'm about to finish a, a group of songs, another album. I have a couple of different projects, but I'm about to finish another album. And it's basically the lyrics reflect on a lot of time in Korea. So I'm not directly referencing the what's happened in the last year, but it has had a kind of, there's been, because of the amount of anxiety around the world, the amount of very frank conversations I've had with yourself and um, other good friends of mine, it has lended itself to a bit more of a literal way of writing in songwriting and also in terms of shooting documentary footage and whatnot. Um, Every time I go somewhere, I usually end up taking a video of life during these times. And I'm not trying to look for the, you know, trying to connect it to the coronavirus all the time. Now, I don't know exactly why that is, but maybe to get back to the, the point at the top of the house is that ways to deal with these times, maybe just focusing on things that haven't changed. Maybe this answers your question is that it has had this change in me where I am focusing on literally telling a story or giving a simple view of things you know so has that happened because i've been in my house for a year i'm not sure maybe but i think it i think something has has clicked there a good majority of your of, of your music is very very i mean that saying ethereal is not i mean it is it is very poetic they're very, it's very visual and it's, and, and, you know, if you're not paying attention, you can get lost in what's being said, right. In the, within the lyrics, that is a significant change in your work. Yeah. And I've always believed too, that changes are good to try and challenge yourself on something. Um, as I said, the, the, I'm working on something a bit more simple at the moment, but I've also thought that it's good for your head to do different things. So not alone am I writing songs, but I'm also soundtracking um, just, you know, doc documentary footage of the country in different, different aspects. And of course I work with yourself on projects. All of this feeds back into a, a stimulation of the, of the mind and, and a focus as well. I think it's important to stay busy, number one, but also to be exposed to different aspects of art or music um, that it can only benefit your own work long term. Talk about, talk about Manza. It's almost St. Patrick's Day, right? Coming around this time of year. Um, but Obviously, since last year, we haven't been able to um, play live, basically, right? That's been knocked on the head. 
and that has been a big change. You know, I've been recording at home. I've recorded videos at home. I've, I've, you know, I've been doing all my work, but we've missed that live performance thing. And it, it was always most apparent around St. Patrick's because at St. Patrick's, I mean, there was a couple of years in Seoul where we were the headline gig. I don't know how that happened, but I guess we were the only guys who were like Irish and playing Irish music at the same time there. But um, I, it looks like we're, it'll probably be, you know, it not, not happening this year as well. However, uh, going forward in terms of playing gigs with my friends, there will be, as soon as coronavirus quietens down, we will be playing gigs locally in our town initially and then maybe further afield. But we have abided by the rules for a full year. We're not going to do anything illegal or untoward. However, in terms of Manzai and recordings, um, yeah, I have... I have released in the last couple of years, I've released uh, five albums on Bandcamp and I have another album coming out maybe next month. Uh, and then of course, uh, other soundtrack work on other people's projects. But in terms of Manza, yeah, there's another album coming um, this year and probably more after that, but there's no set dates. I'm my own man. Nobody implies me. So I, uh, I, I, it's coming soon. If anyone is checking out my music who hasn't already and um, feels like buying an album, all of the proceeds from my albums go towards um, dog shelters in Korea. Um, it's a bit of a problem in terms of abandon abandonment of dogs and treatment of animals. And uh, since, gosh, since four, three or four years ago, you know, all album funds have gone towards that. Now, it can mean a big difference in terms of like getting dogs the right injections, um, getting them off the street, buying them a new coat. I don't know, but um, it, it, make, it does make a big difference. And this was a problem uh, pre-COVID. This was something that was going on. And I've never changed. I never thought about changing because the problem doesn't disappear. It's just humans have their own problem now, but animals are still suffering. And I think it's a good cause because um, no matter where we are in the world, there are problems with uh, animal rights. I'm not campaigning for anything. I'm just saying that you get to listen to some music and your money goes to a good place. That's it. Or following you will be so proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We could, uh, and we make all dogs as happy as him. Tony Fahey, a.k.a. Bill Blake, if you know him. Dude, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Um, we've got work to do. Um, and thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. You know, you know how I feel about this. And, you know, anytime we could take the time to, to express ourselves, man, you know. Mm. That's that's the that's gold. So I thank you so much for you know you know taking the opportunity to go ahead and talk and yeah man thank you. You're welcome. It was my pleasure and time well spent. Yeah.